The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V, the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. Hello, Tom. Good to see you. You too. Tonight we return to our email inbox and attempt to address some of the questions that we have received there. And we've got a couple questions, Father, concerning the Orthodox churches. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll just read the, the first email here, which says, A friend of mine who seemed to be a very strong traditional Catholic and sede vacantist recently left the Catholic faith to join, quote, Orthodox Christianity. Could you please talk about the differences of dogma between Roman Catholicism and the schismatic Orthodox, especially in terms of the filioque and papal primacy? Well, the schismatic Orthodox... Uh a little bit of a redundancy there, I guess, because the Orthodox are schismatic. Mm -hmm. uh, they've taken the, the appropriated the name Orthodox to show uh, that they are Orthodox as opposed to the Catholic Church as an institution. Right. So, um, so uh, well, as far as the um, the Orthodox, there's there's a long history. Okay, the the so-called Orthodox churches. And um, going back to long before nine, 950, you know, with the schism of Photius in the East, there was um, tension, you know, bef between the East and the West. As a matter of fact, you might even say that that tension <clears throat> went all the way back to the time of Constantine. Uh, after all, <clears throat> Constantine, when he first took power, uh, after his battle, his victory of the batter, bat, Battle of the Milvian Bridge, all right, and his granting of uh, legal status to the, to the church, um, he, uh, he tried to uh, divide the empire between himself and Licinius, who was the emperor of the East. Actually, uh, the emperor had had a number of Caesars who were kind of subject to him and governing various various parts of the empire that become so vast. <clears throat> but um, uh, Constantine's effort to have Licinius govern in the east <clears throat> and have himself govern in the west ended in disaster. Uh, Licinius continued to persecute the church after the Edict of Milan of Constantine. <clears throat> and there was such tension there that uh, Constantine determined that Licinius uh, could not continue. There was a battle, of course, and Licinius lost, and Constantine reconsolidated the empire. He determined that he would keep all the uh, power to himself. Though. He, he determined that he would be, become the independent ruler of, of all and not rely on a Licinius or other Caesars. So he uh, m determined to move the capital of the empire to the east. He wanted something more centrally located. He wanted especially to keep, to be able to keep, keep tabs on uh, the eastern part of the empire. And uh, so he, he uh, essentially built a city to, to name after himself, Constantinople. It was very grand, right? It was uh, to surpass Rome in its grandeur. Um, it was to become the, em the empire's center of uh, commerce, center of military power, uh, center of arts. Uh, it was the center of the whole imperial life. Imperial life was meant to be there in Constantinople. And uh, after that move was made in the uh, early to mid 300s, Rome fell. The status of Rome fell dramatically. There are those who claim that Constantine uh, brought the church under his own control. 
and that the church became kind of a vassal or somehow ancillary to the state and that Constantine assumed the power over the church and greatly influenced the faith then uh, to become sort of a hybrid of Christianity and paganism. But uh, the fact is, uh, the one very powerful fact is that when Constantine moved the um, empire, the center of the empire, the imperial city of the empire to the east, the pope did not go with him. He was not merely a court chaplain to Constantine. He, uh, he understood that his role was as successor of St. Peter and vicar of Christ on earth to remain in Rome and uh, to live and to die in Rome, to rule, to govern the church in Rome. And I, I think that speaks very powerfully and eloquently uh, to the independence of the church, um, that the Pope would bow to no pressure uh, to follow Constantine in the center of the empire to the east, but he remained firmly, firmly planted in Rome. Now, obviously, uh, this was not the work of a day uh, or even the work of a century, uh, but as time went on and Rome was no longer the imperial city that it had been, it, it uh, became prey to the barbarian peoples that had been held back by the power of the empire. Uh, and they began to make inroads, and so we had the barbarian invasions, as we know. And those barbarian invasions uh, actually, um, you know, came from all sides. They came from the, the, the north and the south, uh, but, you know, wherever there are barbarian peoples, they found inroads to... Uh, to uh, fight their way into the uh, what had been kind of an impregnable fortress up until then. Um, and um, Rome was invaded, was sacked a number of times. Um, uh, the Pope, through all of that, I mean, even in seeing this uh, chaos descending upon the West, <clears throat> because the Emperor was living his opulent lifestyle in the East and primarily concerned with what went on there and maintaining the <clears throat> uh, order there and somewhat abandoned, abandoned the West to its fate to allow it to be, uh, in a sense, devoured by the barbarian peoples. The Pope still did not, did not leave Rome. Uh, he believed, he knew that was his post and that's where he needed to be. Again, he maintained the independence of the Church. There were even times um, when uh, the emperors would send emissaries to Rome to impose upon the Pope. There were times when the emperor's soldiers came to Rome to seize the Pope. Uh, and even to, uh, in, in some cases, drag the, the Pope back to stand trial in Constantinople. But again, this was not because the Pope was a, was a servant and servile to Constantine. It's because the Pope refused to be uh, servile to Constantine. So, in other words, uh, the history of that time shows that the Church was not being paganized by the Empire, was not, being, was not under the thumb of the Emperor. Uh, quite the contrary. Uh, but the Pope was courageously independent very much aware of his spiritual authority and his spiritual responsibility. In any case, the, the tensions that arose from all of this, from the politics and all the rest, <clears throat> the, the growing opulence of the East, uh, the growing disorder in the West, led to a great uh, dichotomy between the conditions in the East and the conditions of the West, so that the Easter, Easterns really did regard themselves as vastly superior to the kind of the barbarian, the, the barbarism of the West, you know. After all, uh, the barbarian tribes had uh, invaded and uh, actually in some cases settled and been converted, you know. In some cases they were converted by the Aryan heretics who um, back even in the time of Constantine were exiled from the empire, and yet they, they turned their attention then to the barbarian peoples on the outside of the empire. And they were their introduction to Christianity. So when the barbarians invaded, they had already been introduced to Christianity in the form of Arianism, 
This was another problem the church had to deal with, with the barbarians. Not only their barbarism, but the fact that this Christianity that they imbibed denied the divinity of Christ and uh, required that they be taught the truth. And uh, missionaries had to deal with them, and often at the peril of their lives, they had to confront the heresy of, uh, of Arianism in, the, in these invading peoples. So um, all of this created some very serious opposition in the East and West, and uh, a tendency in the East to say, we have the empire, we have the emperor, we are the imperial city, we have the power, the military, the economic, the social power, the legal power. We are not uh, prey to these barbarian invasions as you are. Uh, we are not intermingling our peoples with the barbarians and so on. We are superior to you, and therefore we should be independent of you. Uh, while all of this is going on, of course, politics, again, being played uh, by the East, um, affected even the patriarchal seas. Uh, you know, from the earliest times, you had um, the seas of the the patriarchal seas. That is the the, uh, the the bishoprics, as it were, had a certain rank among them. Uh, the first in order of uh, of dignity and authority was that of Rome. But after that, you have uh, you have Jerusalem, you have Alexandria, you had Antioch, right? I mean, Peter had been the bishop of Antioch for seven years before he went to Rome. So these these great seas that trace their origins back to the very very founding days of the church, the time of the apostles, were now being challenged, challenged by Constantinople, challenged by the well, you might call him the court chaplain of Constantinople the Bishop of Constantinople. Patriarch. Patriarch, <clears throat> if only because it was the imperial city and because he was the confidant of the emperor. It didn't have the antiquity that these other seas had. I mean, after all, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria didn't have the status, but it insisted that it must, and it was actually muscling the others out of the way by virtue of political power and overtaking them and challenging Rome, even for the primacy there. Um, again, it was a matter of worldly power against spiritual power. This was a sense of it. That we have the worldly status here, and we, by all rights, we should um, have the ascendancy. So, curiously enough, those who accuse the Catholic Church of having some come to the, to the influence of pagan emperors... Uh, for the govern governance of the church have got it diametrically wrong. It was not the Roman church that fell to that. The Roman church was resisting that and in fact the church of Constantinople was pushing that very, very, very forcefully. You know. <clears throat> Finally it, eru it erupted. It erupted at various times um, over the centuries but uh, there was a tremendous eruption and disruption when a man named Photius uh, engineered the overthrow of the uh, Catholic bishop there, uh, Constantinople, uh, John by name, Photius insisted that he be, well, he was an intruder. He wanted to intrude on the sea and to take power there. Uh, he was excommunicated by the church for this. Eventually this was resolved after not too many years and uh, John was, in fact, uh, recognized as the legitimate bishop in Constantinople. But uh, there was a, something of a compromise there. There had to be something of a compromise. I forget exactly how it worked out. But uh, in any way, the schism uh, that was brewing there uh, eventually was resolved, at least superficially, for a while. But uh, a century later, actually in the year 1054, the uh, schism erupted. Michael Charolarius was his name, uh, led the churches of the East, the Christian churches of the East, out of the church. And um, that was the great movement that was the foundation of the Orthodox churches. Orthodox as opposed to Catholic as institution, anyway. So. Um, this was a, a very, very bad time for this to happen. 
Why? Well, because the, uh, the Muslims were on the move. Well, while they were in the very act, while the East was in the very act of declaring its not only independence, but its opposition, religious opposition to the West, the papacy, the Seljuk Church, Turks had come out of the steppes of Russia, had uh, come into Arabia and uh, Anatolia. They had uh, basically, uh, because of their ferocity, upset the the situation that prevailed in the East, um, in the Near East, the, uh, the the Muslims there had settled down in their societies, and there the Catholics had a certain amount, and the Orthodox had a certain amount of tolerance. I mean, they always had to pay taxes and and have second class citizenship wherever they were, and uh, were often subject also to having to surrender their children to serve as janissaries, to serve as uh, in the um, you know, this or that sultan's army and court and so on. So there was still a great deal of oppression. But they were allowed to exist. When the Seljuks moved in and they adopted Islam, primarily because of its message of world domination by force of arms, this is right at their alley, you know, uh, suited their temperament perfectly because they were very ferocious. And conquest was everything to them. Um, they actually seized the control from the uh, native, even Islamics there, and began a very fierce oppression of the uh, of the Christians. So the status of anyone who invoked the name of Christ in that part of the world changed dramatically with the arrival of the Seljuk Turks. And they were on the march. They were now threatening the Eastern Empire just at the time that the empire broke from the West. The West had been fighting for centuries against the invading barbarians. The Pope had actually been the one to marshal the forces and whatever resistance could be offered. But there were standing men at arms in the West um, who had been largely victorious. The barbarians who had converted, uh, like such as the Franks, would place their their men at arms at the service of the of the Holy See. The East now desperately needed that protection um, because the wolf was at the door in term of, in in form of the Seljuks. And so the Emperor of the East besought the Pope, uh, Pope Gregory the Seventh, to um, you know come to his aid. And Gregory the Seventh, uh, known as Hildebrand because of, it was actually Germanic, he wanted to personally lead an army to relieve the East of this threat. Couldn't do it though. Why? <laughs> because the emperor in the West was giving him a very hard time with the lay investiture problem, and Gregory was resisting that lay attempt to take over of the church to decide who's going to be the bishop, any bishop. Uh, you know, at that time, the lay investiture, the the uh, the uh, civil powers in the East, in the West, beginning with the emperor, wanted to be the one to give the bishop of uh, this diocese or that diocese in their political realm. They wanted to be the one to name them, put the ring on their finger, hand them the crozier, put the mitre on their head, say, "You receive this from me, the duke." you know, the prince, the emperor, you owe me. They wanted to intrude their own warlords and people they had, they owed political favors. Those whom they could trust to be always, uh, let's say, on their side, so to speak, their, their political supporters, they wanted them as the bishops. And they also wanted the revenue. They wanted the revenue, so they'd try to intrude their, their friends and supporters so that they could have the revenue of dioceses placed at their disposal and so on. So uh, Gregory the Seventh was actually fighting this. Again, those who accused the Church of having been, you know, working hand in glove with the civil power, the Church was resisting this unto death. Um, anyway, if you're getting off the track a little bit, but that's why Gregory could not come to the rescue. 
of the Eastern Empire just after it had gone into schism and declared the Orthodox churches separated from the Catholic Church and excommunicated the Catholic Church. Actually, they mutually excommunicated each other. It wasn't until uh, 20... Well, let's see. It wasn't until 10 years after uh, Gregory VII died that um, the crusade could be called. And um, that was when the armies of the, of the West that had been basically trained and battle-hardened for years against the barbarians were now able to march eastward and come to the rescue of the Eastern Emperor at his own request. And the Emperor of the East in Constantinople had declared his intention, his desire to return to union with the Catholic Church. But his Orthodox clergy steadfastly opposed it, resolutely opposed it. That is, the leaders of the Orthodox churches would not do so. Um, in any case, um, you know, the spectacle must have been rather surprising to see the leaders of the four great wings of the Christian army, their leaders arrive at Constantinople to meet with the emperor and to determine the course of action and what they were there to do for him. And he wanted them, the Orthodox, non-Catholic emperor of the East, having now these Christian armies of the West, the Catholics, come to fight for him, he wanted them to swear an oath, all of them, that they would swear an oath that whatever lands they recaptured, they were able to wrestle away from the control of the Islamics, <clears throat> would all go to the emperor of the East, who was still in schism from the church. <clears throat> well, a couple of them did swear that oath, but they might not have been sincere. But the elder statesman of the, of the lot of them refused to do so. He was, he was principled enough. He said he swore an oath when he undertook the Crusader's cross. And that was enough. That was, that was all. He swore an oath to God. <clears throat> and he would not swear another oath to the Emperor of the East of Constantinople. <clears throat> so, with that, it seemed like it had come to an impasse. But I think the Emperor must have realized he's dealing with an honorable, an honorable man here. The others, not, maybe not so much. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, some of them, anyway. Um, again, I'm trying to avoid going into too much detail and the That's names okay. and so on. He did ferry them across the Straits, uh, the Bosporus, and landed them on what is now Turkey, Anatolia. He landed them on the Anatolian Peninsula. Then, then they were in Muslim territory. And this is where the actual fighting began. Well. And there, was, there were skirmishes and troubles also, even before they got across the Bosporus, but that's all unfortunate history, I'm afraid, of errant crusaders and errant leaders who had no business ever, you know, leading anyone. <laughs> but in any case, but these were serious men and uh, noblemen, and they had serious armies behind them. And they fought their way. They fought their way to... Um, to Nicaea, they fought their way across the Anatolian Peninsula at tremendous, with great suffering. Uh, in, the, in the heat of the summer and uh, being attacked and constantly, and uh, I mean, the story is is really heroic. And they fought their way to, you know, uh, Edessa to Damascus, and and uh, you know, there is no adventure story that is more fascinating and, and really chivalrous than this brings out the, the, the most noble and the most ignoble in human nature <laughs> uh, every step of the way um, they actually did reconquer territories they, in the first crusade they captured Jerusalem and time and time again uh, the, the, the day was one when everything seemed lost just by divine intervention I mean, and uh, they held the kingdom of Jerusalem for a hundred years. Um, what, they were, what they had done, what they'd accomplished with all that, was actually to stave off the, the, the conquest of Constantinople. They, they uh, saved the Eastern Empire for centuries. It wasn't until the year, what was it, 1453, that Constantinople finally did fall 
to the to the Islamics, and there was a massive slaughter. Um, but uh, you know, it was the West, the armies of the West, that that succeeded in holding them off there, um, uh, and and giving those generations of the East, um, well survival during those centuries. Now why am I mentioning the history of all this? Because uh, even during that time, in the year 1204 with the Fourth Crusade, um, the again, there, there was conflict between the East and the West, even while the West was riding, as it were, to the rescue of the East here. While the Catholics were riding to the rescue of the Orthodox, as it were. When the um, crusading army actually detoured to Constantinople, and uh, they uh, sacked the city, um, there was political con conflict going on at Constantinople uh, as to who was the legitimate ruler there. Um, it seems that the crusader army had a certain candidate they backed, and. Um, they not only saw an opportunity for plunder, I mean, let's face it, there were any number of the soldiers were not most noble characters there, but um, they saw the political turmoil going on in the East. They had come there basically to fight on behalf of the, the uh, Orthodox capital, Constantinople. And um, they, they, they did. They, there were a lot of. Um, of um, immoral things that happened, I mean, the violence and, and so on, sacking the city. It is, it is thought that that's when the Shroud of Turin, which had been in Constantinople, was actually uh, purloined and surreptitiously brought to the east and wound up in the, uh, in the house of the knight uh, Geoffrey de Charny, and finally the, the house of Savoy. But anyway, that's another story entirely. <clears throat> the, you see, what we've got happening here over centuries now is conflict. <clears throat> and um, starting with the moving of the empire and uh, the conflict of almost uh, kind of a rivalry and uh, sense of superiority on the East and, uh, and a determination of who is actually going to have the power. How did this all turn out? Well, in our own day, we saw the results of this idea. The Orthodox had essentially tied the religious power to the civil power, uh, which in the West the popes would never do. Uh, they fought against doing it. They fought when they had to resist it. They did. But the Orthodox point, essentially, as it, as it developed over the centuries, leading up to the actual schism, was that this is the imperial city, this is where the power is, this is where the, you know, the glory is here on earth, and so on, and this should have a certain primacy. And, um, and the bishop who is the bishop here, who is attached to the emperor, should have a certain status, you know, because of his connection with the emperor. Whenever you tie the religious authority to the political authority, it is always subject not only to a turmoil, it is subject to tremendous swings of fortune, as it were, depending on who, who's in power and, and, and not, who is holding the political power. <clears throat> so having basically made the Orthodox churches in the East um, kind, of, kind of departments of state, if you will, like departments of state, of the, lo the local um, authority, political authority, um, they found themselves finally with the Tsar, who was ordained a deacon and looked upon as the head of the church. Uh, like what Henry VIII wanted to be in England. He styled himself this way. As though he was the head of the church in England because he was the head of the political power in England. That's the way things go. You know. <laughs> Queen is the head of the church in England. You know. the, the royal power, the royal house. The Tsar um, it was the Caesar, that's where Tsar comes from, C-Z-A-R, it's a form of the Caesar, okay? <clears throat> and Caesar was the head of the church, the Orthodox Church. <clears throat> when he resigns, when the Tsar resigns, <clears throat> and you have the Duma left to govern, this very weak Duma, in 1917, 
The Tsar resigned in March of 1917. They're in the middle of World War One, yeah, which they were losing badly, and uh, <clears throat> there was a great deal of political turmoil, a great deal of, of civil turmoil in Russia about this because of the way the nature of the war and how it was being conducted. The Tsar resigned. The Duma took over. Kerensky with his moderate socialists, you might even almost say Mensheviks, I'm not sure that you would characterize Kerensky as a Menshevik, but he has the very socialist tendencies, you know, um, was trying to maintain a certain order. But the Bolsheviks came into Russia, they took over. Okay, the Bolsheviks take over Russia, they are now the new political power in Russia, and they find the church as an appendage now of the government that they control. And they use the church there, the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, as an instrument of oppression for the people. Of course, I mean, who do you think they're going to fill the seminaries with? You know, who is going to be sitting in that confessional? <clears throat> They've got the KGB, right? <clears throat> well, the NKVD and whatever other, you know, initials they used to begin with became the, <clears throat> the <clears throat> KGB, which is more famous, and then the FSB, I think it is. Now... But the point is, this is all, um, you know, government um, police force is what it is, a federal police force uh, to maintain control of the people, uh, of, uh, you know, in the society, their, their own society. And, um, and of course, the, 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 so the church, the Orthodox Church in Russia becomes an instrument of uh, Bolshevik communist Marxist oppression over the people. This is what happens when you join the church together, the, the religious power, the religious authority, and make it an extension of the political power. Mm -hmm. So what they set in motion back then, uh, in the year 950, by the year 1950, became a monster. Under Stalin, the last years of Stalin, he died in 53, uh, became a monster. And the same it is whenever, whenever you have in the East, you have this, the Orthodox power. Uh, the, the power of the Orthodox Church tied to the local culture, to this certain group of people, um, and to the political power governing it. You have an instrument of oppression just waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. that this is the fate of them. So that's, that's a little bit of background as to the uh, connection um, that shows the, the ultimate outcome of this, this error that the Orthodox got themselves into and the jam they got themselves into and just could never seem to get themselves out of it. By the way, when you talk to an Orthodox a layman or uh, a clergyman, even to this day, you'll find this almost um, disdainful attitude toward the West and how inferior it is to them culturally and how the the Greek church especially but the Orthodox in general is so much so vastly superior culturally mm -hmm. to the West mm -hmm. so that endures from generation to generation gotcha. um, they reject the papacy they say they use the uh, the best the Pope is the primus in Paris he is the first among equals okay so there's an order of honor, uh, a certain priority of honor that is given to him, but he has no authority. That the individual bishop of the place, the metropolitan of the place, um, uh, and which the place determined fairly much by the political powers governing it, um, is the religious power. And uh, they don't recognize a pope as such with authority and powers that we know of as truly papal powers. Uh, they reject the ecumenical councils, you know, after a certain part, namely after their, their schism, they just reject that. They don't accept the, the Immaculate Conception because that was defined by papal authority, the Assumption of Our Lady. If they do believe it, if some of the, if a number of them do believe it, it's because they have a, a tradition in that part of the world that goes back to endorse it. But they do not accept any pronouncements of doctrine um, by the Holy See of the Catholic Church uh, as having, having any binding power over them. Okay? Um, there are obvious things they, they uh, follow to some extent, I guess, today. Uh, you know, again, you know, there are certain 
changes that came in, uh, even among the Orthodox, uh, to the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. So, um, but they used the leavened bread, and uh, but then so did the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church. And uh, in, in, the, in the 1400s, there was a great council in Florence. Emissaries were sent. This is the very year that Constantinople, this is the very century that Constantinople finally fell. There was one last great effort of the Catholic Church, and with the cooperation of Orthodox bishops who came to Florence, Italy, to meet in council to try to bring the Orthodox back into the Catholic fold again. But the, the majority of the Orthodox bishops refused to return to uh, union with Rome. And they went back to the East and they, um, to this day, I mean, the, the, the Orthodox churches uh, following from them continue in schism. There were a, a number, I, I couldn't give you a great, I couldn't give you a percentage, but there were a number who did return to union with the church again. And these are known as the Uniates, U-N-I-A-T-E-S. And uh, they, restored, they were restored to union with the Catholic Church. Uh, they have always suffered uh, a level of oppression back in the East because of their reunion with the Catholic Church and because of their acceptance of the papacy uh, as the institution that, that has true religious authority over them almost as though they were somehow disloyal to the political power, um, not uh, trusted. Often the church, their churches had been confiscated by the Orthodox before that, so they were left to have to rebuild for themselves. There was a certain heroism involved in this, in those groups. But to this day now, you'll find that there are Eastern Orthodox churches that are in schism. Uh, Greek Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox, and so on. But you'll also find uh, Catholic churches among those ethnic groups, or those uh, nationalities or cultures. And as I say, they are not referred to as Orthodox, but as Catholic. And as a group, they are known as Uniates because they return to union with the Catholic Church. That's great. Father, could you talk for a minute about the, this idea of the the, uh, the filioque controversy during during the Great Schism? Because it seems every time we hear about the the Great Schism, the Great Schism, we hear about this issue of, mm -hmm. of filioque. But with all the background you've given, it seems that that was totally a minor issue that, that really. Well, I think it was a pretext. Exactly. And I, I think it was a pretext because. Uh, the word filioque was added to the creed by a pope. Mm -hmm. And I think this was their way of saying, okay, we're going to draw the line here, we're rejecting papal authority. <clears throat> we're saying a pope doesn't have the right to the power to do that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but you see, uh, as Catholics, we understand that, that Christ gave special authority to Peter and to his successors. And even councils of the church are subject to the authority of Peter and to be ratified by Peter, to even be considered councils of the church. The Orthodox consider the councils to have the ultimate authority, um, that uh, there is no pope with supreme authority uh, throughout the Orthodox churches, and over the, over the entire church of Christ. They don't, they don't see that position at all. And so um, the idea of a, of a pope uh, adding the word filioque to the creed, to them, uh, is, was um, that was the rallying point for them to say no, we don't accept this because we don't accept the office of the papacy. Right. That's what's the issue. <clears throat> you see, what we call the Nicene Creed was um, the creed drawn up and ratified at the Council of Nicaea, um, even at the time of Constantine. And the central issue of, of that moment in the church's history was the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is being denied by Arius and his followers, right? Uh, you had Arians who were just out and out deniers of the divinity of Christ. You had semi-Arians who, well, they, they kind of twisted things around with theological niceties and uh, vocabulary 
ultimately they they denied the divinity of Christ. Christ. I mean, it came down to the same heresy whether they were Arians or semi-Arians, they called. But um, a lot of the difference had to do with how they played this, you know, and and what they were willing to say in public, if you put it that way, and uh, the pretensions of some to try to fly under the radar. In any case, um, for those who are interested in reading, there's, a, there's an enormous background history to this, which is very worth reading. We can't get into it all now. The point, the, the, the point I, I wanted to make here was that uh, the, um, the Arian heretics um, had to yield because the council of Nicaea, um, through the the enlightenment given to them by a man named Athanasius, who was only a deacon at the time, the area, the, the Council of Nicaea came to see the 318 bishops who had gathered there, came to see what Arius was actually saying in his fancy philosophical and theological Greek. Now, these were not theologians as such, these men. They were men who had been bishops in times of persecution not long before. Many of them bore the scars uh, uh, of torture, uh, missing an eye or a hand, or they had suffered in the prisons under Diocletian. <clears throat> um, but they didn't, you know, know the the philosophical terms of the, the Greek language. So Arius could confuse them. Athanasius saw to it that they were not confused. So uh, when they when they came to understand the import of what Arius was teaching, they they condemned him. They condemned his teaching. The denial of the divinity of Christ was abhorrent to them. <clears throat> the uh, the bishop of, um, of of Bari, Nicholas, went up and even grabbed the beard of Arius. He was so outraged that he would attack our Lord that way. Whom, and, yeah, Nicholas loved very much, but he pulled him right down off his pedestal there. Um, so, in any case, um, <clears throat> Arius was exiled. And his most ardent followers, but one of his sneakiest followers, the Bishop of Nicomedia, stayed on. Eusebius of Nicomedia stayed on and continued his intrigues. Finally, successfully, so that he convinced the emperor that Arius had been misunderstood, misinterpreted, railroaded, and uh, the victim of a great injustice. And uh, as you know, Arius died when he was on his way to Alexandria to uh, receive communion from that very same Athanasius had become the bishop of Alexandria and Athanasius was ready to deny him Holy Communion and to pay the price because the emperor was now backing Arius and uh, but again another story point being that um, the the question of the Nicene Creed if the Council of Nicaea had to do with the identity of Jesus Christ and that he is the true God of true God, right? That he is fully God as well as fully man. The latter part of the, what we know as the Nicene Creed was added later by the Council of Constantinople. A subsequent Council of Constantinople, I think in the very same century, later on the same century, Nicaea was in 325, uh, in the very same century, Another council of Constantinople had to get together and complete the Nicene Creed, as it were, by defining the divinity of the Holy Ghost, because now that was being called into question by heretics. And uh, the church spoke again. Her bishops gathered in Constantinople, and they forthrightly proclaimed the divinity of the Holy Ghost. And at that time, uh, in the Nicene Creed, uh, as it was became the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, because it's referred that to that, that way in Latin, not just the Nicene Creed. Um, <clears throat> the divinity of the Holy Ghost was proclaimed, and it spoke of the Holy Ghost as who proceeds from the Father. <clears throat> okay? That's as much as it said. It didn't say who proceeds from the Father and the Son, but it proceeds from the Father, and that's the way the Council of Constantinople left it. 
Okay. It was only a couple of centuries later, actually more like three or four centuries later, I'm trying to remember exactly the timing, that a Catholic Pope added to that creed the word filioque, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, in, in doing that, he actually completed the creed and added those last words there because, again, of errors that were coming in by heretics who were taking advantage of that omission. That's what the filioque means. Filioque means, and the son. So, uh, the the powers that be in the East saw that as a challenge now. Even if they didn't dispute the orthodoxy, I mean, it wasn't wasn't really so much a matter of the orthodoxy of what was being said, orthodoxy in the sense of the true teaching, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that that almost seemed to be secondary, because if you go to the, the sacred scriptures, if you go to St. John's Gospel, if you go to the account of our Lord promising to send the Holy Ghost in his discourse at the Last Supper, St. John's Gospel, chapter 13, all the way to 17, you read the account of what our Lord said about promising to send the Holy Ghost, you realize that our Lord used several expressions in the course of his discourse, in that promise to send the Holy Ghost. And it becomes eminently clear that the Holy Ghost does, in fact, proceed from the Father and the Son. Um, Our Lord says, the Father will send in my name, I will send the Father, I will send you from the Father. Again, you you have our Lord saying this in different ways. You put them all together, there's no doubt about it. Even the, even the very theology of the East, in a sense, required that it be a procession from the Father and the Son. Because if it was a procession from the Father alone, that's exactly the same way that Christ, that the Son of God, proceeds from the Father. He proceeds from the Father alone. There would be nothing to distinguish the two, you know. Uh, they're, they're actually, it is their relations to each other within the Blessed Trinity that distinguish their persons. And so it is uh, as proceeding from the Father and the Son as an act of the divine will, which is an act of love, that gives the very, the very character, as it were, if I can say so, the person of the Holy Ghost. So there are some very serious, serious theological problems with denying this. It's true. But as I say, the truth of it was not really the issue. Gotcha. The issue was, uh, Pope of Rome made that decision, and we won't accept it. And that's been the, the attitude and the issue all along, to this very day. Hmm. Well, with Francis now, <laughs> you've got another question. You mentioned that these people <clears throat> have left Catholicism and actually gone over to the, to, uh, the Orthodox, which is not Orthodox. I mean, They have actually abandoned everything they stood for in going over there because I mean even in becoming I mean you, you they said there they were city of a contest mm-hmm. well now they've given up their city of a contest because how can the sea be vacant if there's no sea right. if there is no apostolic sea of Rome and Peter's sea then I mean they've not only abandoned their city of a contest position they've actually abandoned their Catholicism too so that they're saying, well, there, there never was actually a Petrine see with authority in Rome, or certainly that, that had successors come down. Um, so this is, again, I think one of the great dangers of this dogmatic state of Vicantism, of people saying, okay, we have the authority to decide this for all the consciences of all the Christian people in the world because we're convinced of it, everyone has to be, we're making this a dogma. It does sound like the orthodox, the orthodox position. And it basically does. I mean, it sounds like they're, they're tending in that very direction. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that, believe it or not, Tom, I mean, I know I've been prolix and going on and on and on here. But, you know, it's not just the type of thing you say, well, they say this and we say that, they say this and we say that. Yeah. There's a whole background here that shows you it's not just the fact that they say, no, they don't like the filioque. What's really behind that? Why do they reject that? And it really is a matter of the authority of Peter um, and his successors, and that, that the very office, Petrine office in the church. Mm-hmm. Now, with, with the split father, did 
uh, did any of the Orthodox churches retain valid orders in their church? Because it, the, yeah. the, the question says here that one of his friends is using canon law to justify his reason, his reason for going to the old Catholic sect by saying that the faithful can seek sacraments from clerics who are suspended or even excommunicated. The, the old Catholic sect? That, that, yeah, that that, that Orthodox. I'm, I'm no, no, well, but the, the, what the does old he, Catholic, he, because there is a difference. Here. Yeah, he says old Catholic. He says old Catholic. Yeah. Well, you know, that's very interesting. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because, in fact, the old Catholics did sort of uh, make nice with the Orthodox. Right, right. And, uh, you know, a lot of people might not know what the old Catholics are. Mm -hmm. But the old Catholics are a sect that broke away under Dullinger. Well, actually, I don't know if Dullinger himself was the one who led them. They wanted him to be their theological leader after Vatican I with the definition of the uh, primacy of Peter, mm -hmm. the See of Rome, and the infallible power to determine the dogmas of the faith. Uh, Dollinger rejected that. He was a theologian in Vatican I. He rejected the definition of papal infallibility. And uh, with him, there were a number of other bishops in the West who just um, would not accept that. Whether they were infected with the liberalism of the times or, or whatever, I don't know. But regardless, they um, were resisting the definition. Um, you know, the democracies, so-called, so-called of the world, uh, did not want that definition. The Masons did not want the definition of the infallibility of the Holy See. They resisted it. That's one of the reasons. Uh, for the invasion of Rome under Garibaldi. They wanted to put an end to that council. They wanted to stop that council. They were deathly afraid of the definition of the dogmatic, uh, the, the infallible authority of the Holy See, of the Pope. And um, uh, so, you know, all the diabolical forces of hell were unleashed <laughs> and that council. The council ever ne never, uh, never had a formal closing. Right. It was dispersed by the mercenary masons of, under Garibaldi. It was like the uh, member of an occult Masonic lodge uh, himself. You know? So, uh, in any case, he's considered to be a great hero of the Republic, but frankly, it was just an enemy of the Catholic Church is what he really was. And, um, but the, um, the, um, the old Catholics took their rise from that rebellion against the definition of the um, authority of the Holy See and the power of the Pope to make dogmatic, dogmatic definitions of faith that bound the consciences of all the Catholic people. A definition of the, that was made at the First Vatican Council. Uh, that's why Vatican II actually was, was really considered to be the anti-Vatican I. Mm -hmm. It was meant to undo Vatican I. And it did. Uh, even even Ratzinger, who became Benedict XVI, who <laughs> people hailed as some kind of great conservative, uh, said that Vatican II was the French Revolution in the Church. I mean, he said it, quote unquote. So, uh, in any case, the um, the old Catholic sect grew up there, and they had to find orders. They had to find some renegade bishops then, who would give them holy orders, and they found some. One of them, Arnold Harris Matthew, uh, was formally excommunicated by decree of Pope Pius X in 1911. And Arnold Harris Matthew alone founded seven different churches. I'm not talking about just buildings, I'm talking about seven different religions in a sense, mm -hmm. with seven different names, and they're all the so-called old Catholic religions. He got some really strange characters to line up with him, some really ecclesiastical adventurers <clears throat> who managed to get themselves ordained and consecrated in various ways. Sometimes, unfortunately, uh, kind of cro cro interbreeding with the Orthodox, kind of fringe you know, bishops of the Orthodox, bringing the Orthodox lineage into the old Catholic lineage. But that whole thing has become so shady now, it's very difficult to trace these lines back in such a way, you know, who ordained who, who consecrated who, when. It's difficult to follow them back in any coherent fashion that you can really have the confidence that they're, they're, they have remained valid. 
that the lines have remained valid. I mean, uh, there are there are lists published, even even hardbound books published, of the lineage of these independent autocephalous, in, in, independent bishops of autocephalous churches now, whole encyclopedias of them, trying to say, well, this one was ordained by that one, and this one was consecrated by this one, and you know, this <clears throat> bishop A consecrated bishop. B, and uh, with these other two bishops, and then Bishop B went on to consecrate so-and-so, who went on to be re-consecrated by, again, Bishop A, who consecrated Bishop B, who consecrated Bishop C, and now he's making... And they just go around in circles. And in some cases, it looks as though they're trying to get consecrated by as many people as they possibly can, because they're worried that somewhere along the line, um, it, it, it's not valid. And um, it's it's become a a real ecclesiastical inferno. Yeah. So, uh, for the sake of these dear people who have made this tragic mistake, I, I would just tell them, please don't don't play this game. This is this is uh, playing ecclesiastical. Uh, well, Russian Orthodox roulette. If you want to put it that way, okay. <laughs> and uh, they should. They should get back in the Catholic Church again. You know, stop to a true traditional Catholic priest and say, "What do I have to do? No, I, I've made a tragic blunder, mm-hmm. and I want to be Catholic again." You know? yeah. um, because uh, they have, well, I don't know, you, you know thrown the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> um, Not Catholic. Yes, <laughs> they, they have pursued a course which the Church has absolutely condemned. Sure, sure. The true church, traditionally, yeah. has absolutely condemned. Well, Father, it seems that, that we uh, that we typically end our programs by somehow tying them back to modernism. So I'd, I'd like, to, uh, I'd, I'd like to, to end by asking you, you this question of if there are uh, some validly ordained priests still in, the, in these Orthodox churches, uh, if, if their sacraments are valid, if, if the, the masses they offer are valid, are, are Catholics permitted to go to these masses and, and venerate if our Lord is actually uh, present there and the Blessed Sacrament? Are they able to still go and adore our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament there? And that seems to be a question that, uh, that, that comes up in regards to the, to, to the Novus Ordo as well, where perhaps there's, there's a lot of doubt surrounding this, but perhaps maybe some will say that, that some of the priests uh, still are validly ordained in the Novus Ordo. They uh, have the right intention, so they're actually really consecrating our Lord, and, and he, our Lord is really present there, body and blood, soul and divinity, and the Blessed Sacrament. Are we able to go and adore our Lord there? You said if, if. and perhaps, and perhaps, multiple times. <laughs> yeah. That answers your question. No. Okay. No. If, perhaps, no. no. Mm. You can't do it. You know, you just can't, can't do it. To be... First of all, if there's any doubt, and there is, you know, and it's not up to the individual to try to resolve the doubt for himself. You know, I'm going to find out if I can figure this out. Um, then you can't just walk in and say, okay, uh, there's a, 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 a host there, and uh, if this is really the body of Christ, I'm adoring it. If not, I guess I'm adoring a piece of bread. But if, you know, our Lord, if you're really here, then I'm adoring it. If you're not, well, I'm just kind of staring at a piece of bread. You can't do that. Uh, Catholics are forbidden to do such a thing. But even beyond that, I mean, even beyond that, even if you knew as well as you can, I mean, even, even if you had certitude, okay, that this was validly consecrated by a validly ordained priest, you could not go in and worship in those churches without giving a scandal. Um, without giving grave scandal. Um, you... Um, <laughs> Oddly enough, I mean, those who are supporting the the uh, you know, what is this the old the, the use of the old Catholic line and so on and the, and and blurring the lines between Catholic and Orthodox and saying, well, you know, you should be able to have intercommunion and so on <clears throat> during World War Two, um, or maybe it was World War One actually. I think of it. The very question came up whether. Uh, Catholic chaplains could absolve and give Holy Communion to uh, fallen uh, ally soldiers who were Orthodox. 
It might well have been World War II also, because the Russians, you know, were quote unquote our allies under Stalin, the communist allies fighting against Hitler. But in any case, it involved Catholic chaplains and what they could do for dying members of the Orthodox Church, soldiers who had been wounded in battle. And the answer given was that they could not give them Holy Communion unless they unless they came back to the church, unless they then they made the profession of faith and, and um, stated their, their will to be reunited with the Catholic Church. Otherwise, they couldn't receive. Uh, a Catholic um, chaplain could, on the basis of the individual's repentance, apparent repentance, and perhaps ignorance, uh, give them at least conditional absolution, for their sins, uh, so that they could die in the state of grace, because the, the Catholic chaplains had the power to do that. But giving them Holy Communion, no. I mean, here you have a case, in battlefield conditions, a, a schismatic Orthodox dying, and Catholic, Catholic uh, uh, chaplains were not permitted to give them communion, because they were not in communion, because it was a fiction. They were not in communion with the Catholic Church. Simple fact, right? And you see the modern code of canon law that came out under John Paul II, right? <clears throat> that allows that, you know, under certain conditions that don't amount to much <clears throat> in practice. Now, intercommunion is, um, uh, if not the norm, it's generally accepted. Right? Um, I mean, look at uh, uh, Brother Roger of Taizé receiving the host from the Novus Ordo. Look at uh, uh, the, who was it? Tony Blair, right? Receiving the host right there in the Vatican. And then Bill Clinton in Africa. Yeah. Uh, these are the, the so called norms they have now. Uh, but this was absolutely not the mind of a church at that time being in communion, but the church meant something. But they, again, the Novus Ordo, modernism, you say we always get back to that, has essentially erased the line of being in communion with. Now it's all a matter of degree. We're not in full communion. We're in partial communion with, you know. What does that mean? <laughs> Essentially, in practice, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, so uh, this is what they've done. Um, but communion used to mean something. Uh, being in communion with, and co holy communion itself used to mean something. Now people just get up, put their hand out, receive a wafer, and, and, and uh, put it in their mouth and walk away. State of grace, what is that? State of mortal sin, what is that anymore? And um, they, in, in breaking down the whole idea of being in communion with the church, they really attack the whole idea of what holy communion is and being able to receive the blessed sacrament. What is required of, of a person to be in union with the the church. So this is what modernism does. Then. It, it's like an acid. It's like acid rain. It just eats away everything. The ultimate goal, eat away all dogma, eat away all doctrine, <clears throat> so that there's nothing to keep us from just all being absorbed, all being absorbed into this <clears throat> one, one world church. Um... The only doctrine of which will be, you know, that mankind is God. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're they're well on their way, I sad to say. And it seems that uh, uh, traditional Catholicism is, is still the only thing that really stands in their way. <laughs> yeah, it seems that the uh, solution never changes, huh? No. That one still just needs that. We need to have a, a universal. Because we still believe in dogma. Traditional. We still believe in doctrine. Yeah. And uh, there, is truths, there are truths that are non-negotiable and do not change because they pertain to God and God's works. You're so rigid, Father. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, thanks for being here tonight, Father. Thanks for all the, uh, all the history lessons. Oh, Appreciate well, it. sorry. I hope I didn't bore you out today. No, that's all right. That, that's what was requested, so that's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very well, much. Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> well, God bless you. Thank you. Love Thank you. you. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.